too. Hello and welcome, ladies and gentlemen. This is Run It Back. My name is Remco Rinkema, and today I am joined by the 2015 WSOP main event champion, Joe McKeon. We're going to watch the entire final table, break down some hands, go into what it was like to win the main event because we all want to know that. But first and foremost, Joe, how have you been holding up during this uh, quarantine? I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure the online poker streets have been very, very kind to you. Yeah, um, I'm out here in New Jersey playing the World Series of Poker right now. Uh, just playing pretty much every day. Every day there's an Olympic Hold'em event, and we're only got a couple events left, but I'm hopefully going to keep doing well. Uh, it, it's been a different change of pace because for the last couple of months, we've basically not played any poker since we've been stuck at home. So it, it's good to get back in the streets, battle with some with some talented players, see where I stand, all that stupid stuff. And then as far as, you know, winning one, I mean, everyone's sort of striving for that. You managed to uh, cross one off, um, you know, real quick on that one. Um, what, what's it like winning an online bracelet event? Is it, does it just feel like you won a big online event or is there a little bit of extra sort of sauce on top there? Uh, I felt real stressful. It was definitely different since like I played a lot in the live poker and you get to see people and like you can tell that they're stressed. But like when you're behind a screen, you're the only one that you know that it's stressed and it's just a huge grind and like winning one, I feel very fortunate, lucky. It, it felt good. Like I'm, I, I don't usually play online. So being able to do something online is like a big checkbox off my list. That's awesome, man. Well, we're excited to have you on the show here because this, of course, was the big breakout moment for the international audience to get to know Joe McKeon. And this main event is one that has plenty of interesting storylines. But the biggest one, of course, was the way that you came in as a favorite and closed it out. Uh, for the people watching this show right now, let us know in the comments how you feel about this final table, how you feel about Joe's play at the final table, because we're going to watch it all. We're going to break it all down. And if you like the video, you know, please hit that like button subscribe to the channel, do all that good stuff, and that way we'll make sure that as many people as possible can find this show. Uh, Joe, I'm just going to hit play here on the show. We're going to watch these first couple of minutes, get excited, get back into the scene, and, uh, and see how much you remember of this day. Yeah, let's do it. It's time to play the game. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the 2015 World Series of Poker main event final table. That bracelet and nearly 7.7 .7 million bucks awaits our next champion. Fans have come from all over the world to watch poker's biggest spectacle and support players from four different countries. Lon McCarran here with Norman Chad and Kara Scott. Nothing quite like poker, the Penn and Teller Theater, and November. 24-year-old Pennsylvania pro Joe McKee and the overwhelming chip leader to start. As Uncle Ben said in Spider-Man, with power comes great responsibility, indeed. And with a big stack comes great responsibility as well. McKee expected to win. That's a lot of pressure. Belgian's Pierre Nouvel, the oldest ever November Niner at 72. 72 is just a number. Damn, that sounds old, though. Matt Steinberg is the sharpest dresser and the most accomplished player remaining. The clothes don't make the man the cards do, but I like how Max dresses, beats a hoodie and a bandana over your mouth any day of the week. McKeon with about All right, here we are looking at the chip counts coming into the final table. Joe, it was pretty, pretty clear that you were the overwhelming favorite. You know, you played really well. You have a ton and ton of chips. But as far as coming into the final table from your perspective, how did that feel? Obviously, good on one side, you know, having all the chips, but was there any added pressure from you knowing that if you don't win it's going to be forever sort of held over your head in a kind of way i felt like i was at the advantage to do more than everybody else so i was just going to play my game hope it worked out um i got kind of lucky early that like i didn't really run into anything that would give me any pause to to like switch my game up or anything like everything i did kind of worked so that that was like really lucky it, it, it was a good feeling i definitely thought like i, I would go deep at least like just because you have a third of the chips in play doesn't mean you have to win the tournament, but like you should be getting, you know, top three, top four, a lot of the time and being cognizant of where you are in the standings. If something changes, if something gets to the point where maybe you're not the overwhelming chip leader anymore and you have to adjust, like I was confident and ready to do all that stuff, but <laughs> uh, it, 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 I, I definitely wanted to come in and win. I right. mean, everyone does, but I, I felt like I needed to come in and win. Yeah. So while you're watching the first couple of hands play out here at the final table, let's go back and talk about your lead up to the final table. Um, you know, I'll be I'll be the first to say that uh, you were really noticed on the penultimate day when you were in Negrano were at the same table. But, you know, talk to us about sort of the roadmap you had to make the final table. Was it an easy ride? Did you were you ever down to a few antis? Like what was the story there? Well, I, I had a lot of chips the whole time. 
and then like on day six, I ran into a lot of resistance. I started losing chips. I had to hit a river to survive. Uh, after that, like I just won all the important hands. Like if chips, if chips got in, I was the winner of the hand. And that was really like the story of it, I guess it was lucky. It was fortunate, but, um, I also like before when we got to the final day, I remember like the first hand I played, I raised and got like three callers and I have sixes and the flop had a six on it. And I'm just like, okay, this is going to be a really good day. This is all I need. I want a big pot with it. I want a lot of pots afterwards. I just had a good amount of chips. Then like I want another huge pot with sixes. And then um, after that, I, I kind of realized like the timing of the pot was great. Cause like, 10 or 15 minutes after that pot, we went on dinner. So I got to like go out and be like, okay, we're on this huge bubble where I don't know, maybe 12, 13 people away. And now I have an overwhelming amount of chips compared to everyone else. And the way this pay, the payouts were structured, making the final table was worth a lot more than trying to accumulate chips for the final table. So I, I kind of had the opportunity to talk about it, strategize on break with the people that I hung with. And they kind of told me like, yeah, maybe you should get really aggressive and just kind of don't care and see how it works. And like the story of, of the final table is like, whenever I tried something, it just worked. So I was never deterred from doing it right. and it kept working and it kept working. And, and that, that's just kind of how the whole tournament went. And like when things happen that way, it, it's just like a beautiful thing for you. Right. Um, two iconic moments I want to go back to from before the final table. Um, the hand against Justin Swartz, uh, insane cooler, and the hand, hand against Negranu. Do you have specific specific memories of those two moments from your perspective? Or because you end up winning it, do, do those two moments become, you know, a lot less important? Well, no, those are, those are probably the two hands that everyone's going to remember. I don't think anyone's going to... Like, this final table wasn't super active or there weren't too many like huge hands or spots or anything it, like those were the hands that were definitely the most entertaining pre-final table. And that, that hand against Justin was the one I was talking about that kind of like right afterwards we got to go to break and I got to evaluate the situation. That was massive, of course. Um, and the one against Daniel was kind of just like, it, it, it felt expected that we were eventually going to class for all our chips. And we did once or twice when he was very short, he won them all. And then afterwards, um, after that hand, it was kind of like the anticlimactic, like, all right, we're, now we make the final 10. We're almost there. I got him, so it's probably my time. It's not his time. Um, I, I finally eventually got him, and, like, the battle kind of – it felt like it was over Right. at that point. You know, we had to get through one more person. I was still in this mindset of, like, all right, well, I'll try to win every chip because 10th through 9th is, like, this massive pay jump. No one wants to get uh, 10th, obviously, and – got to keep focusing on where I'm at and then I could like you know relive the moment over and over and over again forever after after the thing was over at least after that day was over right and we'll talk about your preparation for the final table in just a second but here you shove the button with ace four pretty standard so it seems Chan was a short stack call the lane with king queen also seems pretty standard and we lose a player here right off the bat uh, him getting sent to the rail um, yeah, th this is like the adversity thing I'm talking about. Like you go all in with ace four and you get called, you're usually behind. And like he had the one hand I beat that he probably calls with yeah. in the spot, which is like, okay, so the final table is going to go like this. Great. Like I'm not going to lose. No <laughs> adversity whatsoever. This is like the second hand off the deck too. So I'm sitting here like oh, right off the bat, I'm already giving up a double up. What can I do about it? All right. I still got a lot of chips. I got to chill. Now he's got chips to my left. I got to think a little bit, but nope. <laughs> I just won the hand and. And it was great. Yeah. Like no adversity like, whatsoever. Like mentally, you're almost already like four handed, you know, because even if you do get this, <laughs> even if you do get some adversity, it's still pretty impossible for you to give it all away that fast. But, you know, that never happens. So it's not a scenario that we have to discuss. Um, back yeah. to the Daniel hand for a second there. Uh, clearly, the room was electric that day i remember sitting up on the perch overlooking the the sort of the feature table setup uh, as we stern was tanking his way to the final table on the other table while you and daniel were providing you know great entertainment on the other table um what's it like to knock out the one guy that everyone wanted to see at the final table and then as an attachment to that question would you have rather ha had him with you at the final table no no no, God, not at all. He's going to play pretty good on the final table. No, thank you. I'd rather him, uh, I'd rather get rid of him as early as I can. But I mean, when you're down to 11 people and he's on your table, it's not like you can avoid him any longer. You just got to go. 
and you know like if he's on the final table everything's different um I, him alone would probably kind of change the whole way the final table is played so him him getting eliminated is like exactly what i needed it it, it like once you get rid of a guy as accomplished as that, it feels like your path is a little bit easier. So when I got that opportunity, it was great. And I know everyone was rooting for him. It would have been better for everybody and like poker in general and like the entertainment value if he was there. But, you know, I, I got to do what I got to do. I'm, I am trying to win the tournament. I'm not trying to make it as entertaining as possible. I, I am on the side, but I, I'm, I, I can't think about this when I'm trying to run him over. For sure. No, obviously not. Um, but if you look at it in hindsight, do you think that people were maybe rooting against you because you were the guy who busted Daniel? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and they probably should have been because to your average poker viewer in 2015, you know no none of these nine people probably coming in. You might have heard of Pierre, and that's probably about it. You might have heard of Max as well. Everyone else, we're all just, you know, our first huge spot. Um he's the dude you know him and Fedor made day seven and those are probably the only two people that a lot of the regular crowd would know at the time so when neither of them makes it, it it's kind of like may, maybe a little disappointing for them because now the entertainment value or their interest probably just goes down naturally right but um you, you know it, everything changes if if you have these accomplished players on your final table you have someone to root for like the phil ivy year i know is huge and this is still a november one so there's there's four months of lead up into this and if you have someone like negranu being able to give you four months of lead up that's pretty absurd uh especially from the media side of it but now that he's not there you got to interview you know you got to come out and you got to interview these nine reasonably unknown players try to get as much uh, build up as you can for that compared to just having the natural build up of having an accomplished player there. Not that anyone here is an accomplished, but you know, Daniel's no, no one, all of us combined are not as accomplished as him. So. Yeah. And as far as exposure wise, you know, tier a is very, very small. It's probably Ivy, Helmuth, and Negrano. And then, then there's already a drop off after that, you know, even, even someone like a Fedor or, or I would even say like Esfandiari is lower than those three guys. So obviously, as far as attention, that would have changed things a lot. Um, what was the four-month period like for you, uh, being the chip leader, knowing what you know, and then getting ready for this big day? So nobody really knows anything is the great part because, you know, this is the first time any of us have experienced anything like that. There, there's only been a handful of people that have gone through like a four month period before the break. So what I tried to do is I tried to talk to a few of them that I knew. I knew John Dolan did it. I knew Reese did it because we were uh, all friends before. Um, I think I tried to talk to Duhamel with not a lot of success because like he also came in with a huge chip lead me and him had like our path to the tournament seemed very similar so i wanted to get his thoughts but at the same time poker in 2010 or whenever his was, was a lot different than now in 2015 it's a lot more technical now there's a lot more math involved there's a lot more icm involved um i i just tried to do what i could with kind of knowing what to expect like some of the best advice i got was like yo just so you know they're gonna like you're going to pause like every 10, 15 minutes for commercial because you're playing on live TV. And I'm like, Oh, I would have never even thought of that. And that would probably bother the crap out of me, especially if I'm trying to run the table over. So when he told me that, that was like a really good piece of advice that you wouldn't even think of, but something as small as that is like really good to know. Um, then preparation was whatever. I kind of just tried to play as much as I could. because I didn't really know what I could do as far as like studying hardcore. Cause I already had a good idea of what I wanted to do. And when you have a four month period, you have reads on people, but they have four months to like change everything or like kind of figure out their reads on you and kind of adapt properly. So it, it's kind of almost a new ball game when you come in four months later. I, I kind of just went in with the general baseline, hoping it would work and it did. So the little bit of studying I got to do at the end too was great. Like we just go back and watch final tables, me and my coach Cal. And every time he, he like had a spot. He's like, what would you do here? I, I would do this. And he was just like, good. I think that's exactly what you should do. I'm like, all right, good. This is really good for my confidence. Like I, I, I kind of already feel like I know what I'm doing. Right. Uh, once, once more, speaking to what you said earlier, uh, you raised with the ace king, Bruderoni wakes up with ace jack, you know, sm smooth, smooth sailing as far as the showdown goes. And, and a nice smile yeah. there. Um, I mean, he's got like five bigs in this hand and he's 
just way far and away eight of eight or whatever. Like the next closest stack probably got like ten million. He's got two and a half million. So even if he wins this hand, right? Like this this one wouldn't even hurt me because he's playing so incredibly tight to my left anyway. It doesn't really matter. I can get away with everything. Yeah. But you know, you don't want to give him a bunch of chips and then get let him get pesky, let him get uh, confident. You know, you still want to win. It, you also lock up the money when the player is eliminated. Right. You can't finish eighth anymore when someone else finishes eighth. So that's like really good. Right. So. Actually, that's a good that's a good point that you make. Uh, how aware were you of the payouts, and how important was it to get to a certain level threshold? And how invested were you in the main event, it being a 10k event? You know, did, was this like life changing, or did you sell a lot of pieces, and therefore you had to get at least top two in order for it to be, you know, worth your time, so to say? Well, it's already worth my time. I mean, you come into the final table, you got a million dollars in your pocket, but now, you know, there, there's six more million to win. So I got to do what I got to do to win. Whether I'm backed or if I have all of myself, I don't think it changes really the way I play. Uh, at least it shouldn't. I, I try to make it not. I don't want to like, the, the, every, anytime you're backed and you're like a professional poker player, there's always a little bit of doubt in your mind sometimes about potentially looking stupid, doing something dumb because your backers might not like it or whatever. But like w when you get over that, you, you tend to play a lot better because if you think something's like a good play and even though it might be stupid, then like, Hey, you get to learn from it later because you're back and be like, yo, I don't think this was that good of a play. And also like you're putting yourself out there because if it is a good play, then you're not missing it, which is also a real big deal. Right. Yeah, that, that's interesting. But then as far as you said, you know, you can't finish eighth if the eighth guy gets knocked out. Um, were you in your head doing the math of every elimination was, you know, that much more freedom? Um, not really because i had so many chips like i remember the pay jumps from like ninth to eighth to seventh were all very small then when i got to day two i think it, it kind of mattered a little more because you're talking about I, i mean all this money is huge like i'm saying small but like the difference from ninth to eighth was like eighty thousand dollars or something that ain't small that that's massive but you know and, and that's eight buy-ins in a tournament of ten thousand dollars if you think of it that way but i mean it, it, th there's a real money aspect obviously because eighty thousand dollars is eighty thousand dollars That's a lot, but I, I, the more I thought I focused on the numbers, I think the less, like, I, I might have gone into a shell a little bit more if I did think about the numbers. So I tried not to as much as I could. Everyone else had to think about the numbers a lot more than I did, and I kind of took advantage of that because I was in the spot where, like, I, I never got close to busting, so I didn't have to worry about it. Well, that was a big advantage for me because if, if anyone ever got close to me in chips, then I can start thinking, like, all right, well... I got to make sure I don't bust before the guy with a short stack because now this guy's got all the chips too. So I got to tread carefully. I never even got in that spot. They all had to tread carefully with me. And that's, that's obviously going to be an advantage for that person because if you have to tread carefully, then you're probably having to play a little less optimally. Right. But for, if, if we look at main event winners, over the last decade or so, there's been a, a wide variety of type of players who have won. Martin Jacobson, you know, grinding the, the circuit worldwide, playing high binds for many, many years, uh, but also Kui Win. Basically, looks looks as though he came straight from the casino and just rolled up and won the main event. Um, you fit you fit somewhere somewhere in the middle. Obviously, much more towards the Jacob, Jacobson side of the spectrum. So, how important was it for you to have that experience? To have you know an 800k score and to have multiple six figure scores that were outright wins on your resume as far as experience goes, as far as, as far as financial security goes, coming into this final table. Well, yeah, that, that, that's obviously great. You feel like you have um, the confidence and being there before is like a big deal because a lot of these guys probably haven't been. So you don't know how they're going to react, but you kind of have an idea how you're going to react. And, and like if you've gone through a bunch of trials and tribulations before in a spot like this, which I, I mean, this is, you know, it's not the same thing as like playing a little thousand dollar final table, but it, 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 it's still poker at the end of the day. And w when you have that experience, it definitely helps a little bit. I don't think a lot of the players on this table specifically had a lot of deep experience on any final table at all. Like th like Neil, for instance, I I he might have never played more than like 12 tournaments before this tournament, as far as I know. No one's ever heard of him. There was like no information on him whatsoever outside of, you know, just what he looks like. And he's 60 something years old at this time. And, you know, you can kind of expect what, like, a 60-something-year-old guy is going to do to your left as a chip leader. And you kind of just hope that your assumption of him matches the assumption in case you get in a big pot with him early. And then if you do get in a big pot with him early, like, your assumption, if it's right, you're going to be more likely play, like, 
you're going to more likely play the hand well and not mess it up. But I mean, you also have to adjust on the fly to what people are doing. Cause like I said, you have a four month break. I don't, I didn't play a hand with the dude before the final 10. So I knew nothing about him. So I could only stereotype basically what I thought he would do, or maybe like what I saw in the, the TV shows beforehand. If I saw anything that I thought was like noteworthy, for instance. How good was, how, I mean, sorry to interrupt, but I was very curious about this. How good was Joe McKeon in 2015 compared to, you know, the, the, the field? And, I, I, and I'm not going to compare you to the main event field because I know that's super soft, but how good were you as a player as far as your skill level looking back? I mean, I'm, I'm a lot better now as than I would back then. The game's changed a lot. Like in 2015, that was like the first year like people were defending their big blinds as far as I was concerned. This is the first year I started like calling the big blind, the hand like ace five, for instance. And it, it was it was different because it, it felt like there was a lot of skill involved in the game when you got to do this. Um, I, I was probably a bit passive back then, believe it or not. I, 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 I even now I tend to play reasonably tight and I don't try to get too out of line, but nowadays, like there's a lot more barreling on the turn. Cause there's a lot more floating on the flop. So that's an adjustment you have to make back then. There was not a lot of that. Like, I don't know if I even had to like bet a turn without a good hand here the entire day. If I bet the flop I, and some of that too was like, I usually just had a good hand on the flop, which is, you know, very lucky, but all, all that stuff is like, important because especially when you get to a final table that's where people have to tighten up a little bit so in theory those plays should work even more but i never really even had to test that out so it was good i just got to play kind of kind of straightforward no one was really making too many big moves nor should they because it's a lot of money if they're wrong or like they lose on their big move that's a lot of money they just lost all that type of thing um i i mean i'm a good player now for sure and I still know how to play a final table. And I think that's really important because it's something I think a lot of even the top regs can maybe not do as well as me. And that, that's where like all the money's made, right? You're on the final table. I can play, you can, you can play amazing up to the final table, but as soon as every pay jump starts becoming, or every person busting starts becoming more and more money, then the game changes a bit. And if you can't adjust wherever you are in the tournament, then you have, you, you're going to have like, you're going to be making like, maybe not optimal plays you're going to be missing spots or maybe you're going to be taking too many spots and just the, the amount of dollars you're winning is fluctuating more than it should and it's fluctuating down more than it should so when you get the opportunity to to really come on just do what you need to do um take care of business basically right i'm pausing it here real quick you fold the ace five you had some talk there back and forth with max um you know for the people who are watching this show for the very first time we talk you guys watch and listen and then we'll break some hands down along the way um in this hand he he of course makes trips as, ev as everyone can see is that an easy fold on the river because his ranges is not going to include anything other than you know the only thing you beat is a bluff basically yeah it, it's a spot where it looks like i have a good hand i have aces and queens with king kicker so it looks like i should be good but a jack beats me a queen beats me so he checked back the flop on this hand and actually let me catch up on the turn which uh worked out for him although if you bet the flop i would probably still call it with ace high because it's button on blind but like i said i don't think in the main event people are like taking huge spots like this i don't think you're going to see too many river bluffs here it's hard to find too many hands he could be bluffing with that he bets the turn and the river with because even if he has a hand like i do with ace five he's probably not even going to bet the turn he's probably going to check it back in case i'm trapping with a queen or a straight or something and like if i have like a 10 for instance i'm probably not going to call his bet anyway because an ace is such a bad card for me so i'm just going to fold so when, when he bets the turn and the river, it, it looks really strong. It's annoying. Um, I did try to talk to him. I tried to talk to a lot of people on this table, but no one ever talked back. That was kind of something I learned from my coach. Like, so he was basically like, you clearly have this aura of confidence about you and you have the freedom because you have all these chips and you know, you're not at risk. There's like all these guys are going to be more stressed when they're playing a pot with you. So if you talk with them, you might break them down a little bit and be able to use your, your uh, live tells in order to, to maybe pick something up in the hand. Now, I didn't do that. And I tried in this hand, but I didn't pick anything up. Um, but, but even doing something like that, it, it's just different too. Cause like you're down to this massive final table, everyone's supposed to be stressed. Right. And I'm, I'm the one that has the confidence to talk to you and try to really break you down. Whereas like the person is really probably has to sweat a little bit because of that. And something like that, even if it's like a small intimidation factor, that, that could really work in your advantage. And it might be nothing. I might just be blowing smoke up my ass right now. But um, 
it, it made sense conceptually for me to do. And like, I think it worked. But also at the same time, even if it doesn't work for them to feel worse, if it makes you feel better, it also has a positive effect. If you, if you can have that feeling of like, I can talk, I can feel confident, that then also just works in your own favor, even if it doesn't necessarily affect you know, any one player in particular in some kind of negative way. Oh, I totally agree. Like, it's just more confidence for me. I don't think I'm lacking confidence at this spot because I don't really have any reason to. And um, if I got a reason to, though, that might be a way to talk myself back into it. Right. But like, even if it's like, you want to play a pot with me, you want to bluff with me, you might get an interrogation by the end of it if I think you're bluffing. So do you really want to like, A, put the bluff out and then B, go through the interrogation? You know, when you're at this stage of the tournament, it's so stressful. At least I think it could be that it's just kind of worth it because no one else on the table is going to have like experience talking in a spot like this. Like, I mean, I don't, I didn't either. I just kind of did it because I felt like it was right. Right. Uh, for the people who are just getting to know you now for the very first time, um, we talked about your lead up to making the main event final table, but you know, what was the lead up to, you know, your poker career blossoming in the way that it has, obviously you having, you know, fair bit of results before the main event final table, like what allowed you to, I, I guess I'm scrolling back on your hand and mob to back in uh, 2010 to play uh, your first ever uh, live 2k event, which was, um, was it Verona? Where's that? Is that uh, on the East That's Coast? Turning Stone. Turning Stone. There you go. So it's Turning Stone. Talk to me about how your poker career got started and, and you got to a point where you could play these you know bigger live events. Yeah, I played online pre-Black Friday for a while. Um, I didn't do anything in high school and I didn't do anything in college because I was spending a lot of time playing online. So that's kind of where it was. And then Black Friday happened. I think I was a sophomore in college. I didn't know what to do. I stayed in college, played some... I, I wasn't 21 at the time. I think I was 19. So Turning Stone was like the first place I could go. Um, I went to Turning Stone before Black Friday as well, but it's like, all right, I guess I'll just play these tournaments on the side while going through college and doing whatever. And then like I got, I went to PCA when I was 20. That was fun. Uh, won, won, a, won a little bit of money down there. That was a big deal for me. Gave me some money to go through college with like this confidence of like, oh, I got, I got some money. The college students usually broke by now, right? Like I got some money. I, I have a little bit of a job. I'm going to turn 21 shortly. And then as soon as I turn 21, I'm just going to start traveling places and see what I could do. Luckily I had a lot of success early, so I, I could keep doing it. All that stuff is like really fortunate because a lot of people that are probably doing the same thing, if they don't start off well, then they're in trouble. And like they, they can doubt themselves. They might change their path, even though they can do it. So like I've been very fortunate in my poker career up to that point. I mean, well, that, that the fortunateness has never stopped. I still am. But like at the very beginning, especially, it's very fortunate to get myself like you go deep in a tournament and you, you know, you're just, you get in like a huge flip, a very standard flip that no one played incorrectly. And like the winner of that flip is the guy you remember and the loser isn't. So if you're winning more of those and you're losing, like in a small sample size, that that's going to be huge for you especially when you're kind of at the beginning of your career. If you're making your first major final table and you get bad beat out in eighth place, it's going to suck. But like, if you can run good, maybe get second or third in it, get a lot more money. Like, like something as small as that can really alter a poker career. Right. And I was lucky enough to like, when I made my first couple big final tables to end up winning the tournaments. Yeah. That, that, that's really crazy actually, because it does have such a, m a major impact. Um, we just saw Pierre Noble bust. Uh, I, I love Pierre. He's a, he's a great guy. You got the uh, Jack six, six of Hearts in there uh, against his Ace Jack. Once again, a scenario um, where your opponent was very very short, which you know was sort of a theme here in the the first couple of hours here. Pierre first losing that big hand where he uh, called the race with Ace King from Neil Blumenfield. Neil made made a set of fours, and then uh, Pierre ended up calling him down with uh, with top pair. Um, so looking back at your results, how does a 20 year old kid go into PCA, obviously, you know, understanding you banking a 2k, but then, you know, jumping into uh, a 10 K high roller, uh, and sort of, you know, taking it to the top, or were you already established to a point where, you know, selling a bit of action, taking some shots was, was part of your repertoire? Uh, I actually satellited into that 10 K. Oh, really? It's so that, yeah, I, I had no intention of playing it, but I won the 2k and then it's like, here's a $1,000 satellite, try it out. Right. And I ended up winning the satellite. So I played the 10 K and I think I min cashed it or something, but like a min cash in a 10 K is huge when you're in for a thousand dollars. Yeah. That's, um, that's like 20 X year investment. So 
So back then, when you're and you know if if, if this if this hand goes anywhere, we'll we'll make sure to dive in. But yeah, uh, it's not too important. Okay, good. So then, if you're playing a, a 10k, you know you're 20 years old, you're playing at PCA. I looking at the results here. Eugene Ketchelov is in there. Sean Buchanan, Andrew Chen, um, guys who are established that have been playing for a long time. Was that you know was that fun for you? Was it exciting? Were you nervous? Like what was it like at the beginning of your career versus how, of course, you know that progressed and you became confident and established. Uh, it was definitely nerve wracking, but at the same time, like I, I vividly remember not knowing who anybody was. So like, I just figured these dudes are all good and like they're playing well, but also the game back in 2010 was a lot different than, than it is now. So when you're sitting there playing with just a bunch of people that are three betting and four betting and it's a lot more pre-flop, plus it's a turbo. So I'm sitting there with 15, 20 big blinds. Right. So it's not like we're doing too much play anyway. Um, It, it was nerve wracking because I remember being short on the bubble. So I really wanted to get in. And then, you know, once I get there, it's like a huge relief. It's like, cool, I didn't bubble this satellite. It, it's, you know, I'm, it's like another small score for me for a stake. Like when you, if you're cashing for 20000 off like a $1,000 buy-in, that's, that's pretty good. So something, something like that is just a little bit more of a confidence boost. It's more money in my pocket that I get to take home with me. Right. Yeah, definitely. Good stuff all around. For sure. And then we'll fast forward to the uh, monster stack where you finish in second place for uh, 800K. Um, in, in many different ways, and I've been covering WSP since 2009, the, the guy who finishes second in a monster stack or, you know, top three or whatever, there's so many of those people now over the years. And most of them, you know, just take the money or, you know, play for a while and, and never amount to anything. And back then, you know, th that could have happened to you, but you didn't. You spun it up, you, you took it big, you won the main event, and now you're playing all over the place. Um, but take me back to that moment, because clearly that is sort of like an anchor point from my perspective of like, you know, winning life-changing money and really being able to have a lot more freedom because, you know, winning 800K versus coming home with a hundred K is, is a pretty big difference. Exactly. <laughs> you said it best. Now I have all this money. I can go and play more and I can play bigger. If I want, I can test myself. I could see if I'm as good as I think I am. Um, I thought I did well with it. I, of course I parlayed it. I don't have to like, it, it's another tournament where I ran very well. You know, you, you go through a, I don't know, 6,000 person field or whatever it is, you know, you're going to run really well to get deep. And it, it's just a matter of like kind of having a good baseline of money and now turning it into like real money. So you can go out, you can live a life that's pretty the way you want, I guess. Um, you, you don't want to, you, you want to get yourself to be comfortable where you don't have to worry about money. Right. And like that, that's the score that gets you there. But now like you got to put money in to make more money as far as I'm concerned. So I'm ready to do that. And once I can get to that point, it's like, it's a good feeling that I don't have to worry anymore. I can kind of do what I want. If I can advance, I can accumulate wealth. I put a lot of money away, of course. And, you, you know, like when I'm older, I don't think I'm going to have to worry about funds no matter what happens to me now. So that's really important to me. But it's also from, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's easy when you have a massive score, especially when it's, you know, 800 buy-ins, it's easy to get complacent in a way where, oh, now I have all this money, I can now be lazy, or I don't, I don't have to work on my game anymore because I have all this money. Why did not Why did you not choose that path? Is that just like internal determination and motivation, or are there different factors that play there? I don't think I knew. Like, I don't feel like I have much in life that I want to do outside of play poker, at least right now. So I'm just going to keep dedicating myself to what I'm good at and trying to make more money. I enjoy going out and playing live poker tournaments for a lot of money. And, you know, I have my stops that I really enjoy going to that I don't ever want to miss. And just seeing people socializing, playing games on the side, all that stuff is just like what I like to do. So that's, that's what I try to do. And I don't, I don't think there, I don't think there's another passion that would get me to not do that right now. If, if it comes up in the next couple of years, it'll come up in the next couple of years. And luckily I feel like I'll be ready for it. But for now, this is kind of what I know and what I got. So it's what I want to do. Right. But then as far as, you know, getting better and evolving with the game, how, how have you handled that? Because if you were to play heads up against, you know, 2013 Joe McKean, you would obviously smoke him. Um, and I think it's probably a good thing if you can say that about every previous year, because that means you're still getting better. So how do you stay in tune with that? And how do you make sure you stay at least at least on the curve, if not ahead of it? It's hard. Like I, I the stakes I play, I, I think I'm still beating pretty significantly. So 
it, it's almost like there's a cap because if you put someone like Ollie in the same exact stakes as me, there's a good chance that our two play styles will be incredibly different. And that might, I, I don't know who would play better in the tournament in like a $3,500 for instance, but so, something like that is, is like still what you need to do. You got to get to where you are and you got to adjust to what's in front of you. And that, that's kind of all poker is no matter what the stakes are. Sometimes it's easier. Sometimes it's harder. As long as you have a good baseline, you're going to be fine with it. And like, I, I do like to dabble in the larger buy-ins when I get the opportunity to do so. When I do, it, it's fun. It's, you know, making it deep in that is like feel, it makes you feel super accomplished. So then, and I just want to do that more and more often. So you mentioned Ali Msirovich. Um, what is the difference then between you and him? Well, he's really good and he's, you know, beating up on people playing $100,000 tournaments every day, right? So his game is like incredibly at the top. But if you're playing, if, if you play that, if you're playing like someone playing a $100,000 tournament, they're generally going to be really good. If you're playing someone playing a $3,500 tournament, they could still be good, but they're not going to be at the level of someone playing a $100,000 tournament most likely. Right. So like it, it's just an adjustment factor a lot of the stuff ollie can do in, in a specific spot might not work in a smaller tournament because when he's playing up against like a david peters for instance david peters and him a probably have all this history and b or it, like david peters isn't going to make too many mistakes right mm -hmm. whereas like in the 3500 dollar person or in a 3500 dollar tournament if you're david peter or if you're ali and sirovich and you're playing against a reg at the Borgata, for instance, who's who's probably a good player, but not at the level of the David Peters. If you're playing him like he's David Peters, you're probably not playing him the best way. Right. So, you know, this is the, this is the age-old thing people always bring up: is that Helmuth is extremely good against terrible players because he is Phil Helmuth. Um, are you are you that then for the lower buy-in levels where Joe McKeon can punish all these kids between whatever? 3,500 and below, and, and do you do you have to make adjustments then when you face someone like Imserovich when you dabble in 25Ks? Yeah, when I started, I was definitely really, really good against Fish and a little weaker against the regs. And as time's going on, I think I'm getting closer to being better against the regs. And I actually might even be like getting weaker against the Fish. I don't know. But maybe the Fish are just getting better too. Uh, either way, like when I play against Ollie, Ollie's going to put me in the cage a lot. So I try to not play as many hands against Ollie if I can help it. Um, but when, when I get involved with him, you know, it's still just a good baseline. I need to play the hands that are in front of me. Um, try to play it the best I can, understanding that like he's capable of doing a lot of stuff, trying to figure it out in the moment. We just... And it's tough. I mean, when you play a 25K, you're going to play a lot of people that are going to do that. Their bet sizes, they're going to be a little more difficult for you to face or to kind of figure out what to do. And in turn, you need to kind of do similar to them. You need to put them in the hard spots, whereas like in, in a smaller tournament, you don't really need to put people in hard spots as much because it, it's a little less necessary. If you put people in harder spots, then it should be because like you're playing well. And you're you like like in general when the pot's bigger you should have a better hand right right you don't want to get in a spot but like in a high roller you might have to get in a spot where like you're constantly putting your chips in with not a good hand because it's the only way to get them to fold like a medium hand it's a weird dynamic and spot it's just fun and different to play but like when you get deep in a tournament again in a high roller people are going to play really well on like their short stacks because generally high rollers the structure goes faster which I personally enjoy. And then, like, when you're deep in, like, a big WPT event, for instance, and you're still playing super deep against a bunch of people, like, it's, it's just a different game. Right. Uh, we just lost uh, Tom Cannulli from the final table uh, while we were talking. It was uh, Aces Cracked by Max Steinberg, who flopped a 10. And then we ju just now we saw um, Zwistern moving only with 10-9 suited and uh, Beckley calling it off with the Aces. Uh, Beckley's final table, by the way, really funny to look back on. We haven't heard much from him since. Maybe you can shine some more light on that later. Uh, but it is funny to see that Beckley basically did not have a lot of chips, just like, you know, Noville and, and Buteroni and uh, Chan. But cards went his way, and he managed to spin it up in, in a spectacular way. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see more of him later in the broadcast. But uh, uh, just to get you guys caught up on uh, what's going on. Also, if you like the video, just hit the like button and subscribe and do all that good stuff. That really helps me and the channel a lot. Uh, we're watching the 2015 main event final, final table with the champ, Joe McKean, in case you're just tuning in. Uh, Joe, at this point of the final table, you're just having a, a blast, right? You're just sitting back. 
you know, you're watching people clash. There's, there's lots of showdowns. You're just relaxing or, you know, are you getting antsy and do you want to get this over with and, and crush some skulls? Like how, how are you, how, how are you, what's your mindset like in, in a moment like this where, you know, you're not really involved much. Uh, I, we're at the point now where like, I, I don't think there are too many short stacks. Everyone has like some chips, but they all have enough chips where like they can worry about busting pretty easily. So that's, that's, that's an okay spot for me because like, if I can pressure people to, you know, get them to potentially be busting, that's, that's huge. Right. Cause then they'll have to back down. They'll have to play very cautiously. I can take a lot of chips. Maybe I don't deserve. And w when you get to that point, it's just like, you, you need to keep playing what's in front of you, but at the same time, people can still play poker with you. So you can't just go crazy. You have to, you have to be cautious. You have to pick your spots properly. You have people that are kind of playing back a little bit and you just have to know what's going on. Basically. I, I, we, we know that like, if you make the world series of poker final table, it's really deep you're going to be playing for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours. Cause you have to, because the structure is very slow. Everyone generally has a lot of chips and it, it's just, it's a time consuming thing. So you, while you're there, you're just kind of trying to play what you play the best you can in the moment while also like not, not messing around, I guess. Like you don't want to get too antsy because if you get antsy, you might start playing worse and all that stuff. And you don't want to like give away chips cause you're playing for all this money. You just got to stay focused as much as you can. We're five-handed here. Um, what was your opinion on these players? Let's go through all of them. You know, but let's start with Zvi. What was your opinion on the players at the table? Okay, Zvi was. I played a lot with Zvi before the final table, and he was he was very aggressive and wild and hard to read. And he was in second to start the final table, so I thought he would give me some trouble. I thought if anyone played back, I mean, it'd probably be him. He ended up not really doing that, so that was kind of lucky for me. I didn't have to worry about it. Uh, you have Josh, who is like a cockroach. He's impossible to get rid of. He had 10 big blinds multiple times in this tournament and just found ways to get up and, you know, make a comeback and make a run. You have Max, who I didn't play a hand with until this final table. I just knew the name. Uh, I had position on him, which was helpful. And he has like one of these stacks. He had one of the stacks in the middle where like he's a middle stacks. So, like he's a good dude to kind of come after because he's going to definitely be aware of the money. And it, he's going to have, like, he's forced to care basically about the money. So, so the fact that he's to my right, if he starts trying to get out of line, I think that's an easy thing that I can do to punish him. Really put him in a spot where like he has to do a lot of folding and kind of keep him in line. You have Neil, who I knew nothing about. He's definitely a fan favorite at this point. Cause like, look at the dude. How can you not? I know. Everyone loves Neil. Right. Um, and, you know, me and Neil's great. I've, I've probably seen Neil the most out of any of these other dudes after this because he lives in Florida and I go to Florida all the time to play poker and he's just always there playing. It's great. Um, yeah, he, he's a very nice guy. We're friends. He, you know, something like this, though, got him a life, like a poker life. And like for someone who wants to do it, but doesn't really know how or like you get into it at such a late age as he did. It's like such a huge deal for him. And like the fact that he got this opportunity, I think everyone's happy. Like everyone should be happy for him. Right. And here, here we go with the Ace King against Ace Jack. We haven't listened in much to the broadcast, so let's listen on this. Oh, so I need the dealer's name before he put in the final 400,000. He exposed his cards. <laughs> Neil's got his cards turned face up. He hasn't called yet, Neil. <laughs> <laughs> All right, there's the call. Stern officially at risk and dominated. Yeah, Stern needs to get lucky or we will be forehanded. Neil's girlfriend, Pascal, likes what she's seeing. I love the yeah, hats. There's, <laughs> there's, there's only casually like a million dollars in equity in this pot at least. Right. For whoever wins. Everyone joking around. I mean, the final table atmosphere is unlike any event of the year, and it both makes massive money seem big and small at the same time exactly it's pretty absurd and you're, you're sitting here like i think this is a good amount of neil's chips too i don't think he has that many more chips so if he loses this hand he's going to be the short stack so like th this is an opportunity for him to really get back in to have a bunch of chips to fight with and if he loses this hand you know it's going to be like soul crushing it's going to be so hard for him to come back he didn't so you know that, that, that's a really good turn card so he doesn't even have to sweat the river no yeah. again you can't finish fifth when someone else finishes fifth so everyone just made a like a couple hundred thousand more dollars probably i mean i feel like that's that's your go-to quote now that 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 is the, the a great way to put um how important it is 
to not get eliminated because if someone finishes ninth or seventh or sixth, you can't finish in that spot, which is both a pay yeah. jump and also a relief in some kind of way. I mean, hey, the money is now in your pocket. You can't get worse than fourth place money right now. That's, yeah. that's a big deal. You, like you can't win the tournament when you're nine handed, right? You're not going to get a nine way all in and hope you win the hand. You're, you're going to have to get it up like one at a time. So it, it, it is important and it's really if the money isn't in your pocket until it's in your pocket, you can have this huge chip lead and it doesn't matter until, you know, people are eliminated. If they're all sitting there and, you know, you just have this chip lead and it's like slowly going away, you know, you don't have that money in the pocket and that's a real big deal. That's why we played the tournaments is to just get all this money. Right. And it's, it's, it's the best kind of lottery that we know about. It's both, both exciting, fun, and you got a little bit of uh, a, a skill and, and, and um, I don't know, you got some kind of effort that you can put in to, uh, to make yourself uh, do it a lot better. Um, does the main event final table create bonds? You mentioned and you and Neil, you know, being friendly. The, like, is it is it a unique experience where if you come across a, a, a November Niner from a different year, or you know, see guys from this final table that you know you have a bit of a longer chat and you sort of have a bit of a friendship with those people? I don't know so much about other years, but like if we see each other, if the nine of us see each other in a tournament, we're like, oh yeah, what's up? You know, we we did this thing together. It, it can be a bit of a bonding experience. We didn't become like all like, you know, super buddy, buddy friends, but we're, we do have something that other people don't have. Like we have this specific year as well. So when, when you find someone else that's done it, it, it's not really even like a consideration in my mind and plus like they bring it up. Right. But like, like I see Neil all the time. We're friendly. I see Tom a decent amount as well. We, me and Tom have played online a lot this world series. Um, who else? Patrick Chan kind of moved away, so I don't see him no more, but I used to see him all the time. Uh, and, you know, like, it, it, I'm not going to see too many European players being from America. So, like, a Pierre, Federico, if I see them at the World Series, you know, it's like a head bump, like, hey, what's up, man? Yeah. That's about it. But Z, for instance, as well. Um, but, yeah, it, it, it's, it's an experience we have that won't be taken away from us no matter what. You know, we all went through it. I know Max actually recently commentated on the – bracelet event i just won and he was very complimentary of me and i appreciate that you know i think he has a lot of respect for me and i also have a lot of respect for him both as a person and a player so something like that is it's like you get to know these guys a little bit better because you you're you're all put into the spot where like yeah you're trying to beat the crap out of each other to have all this money but you already made a lot of money in the first place so even if you beat the crap out of them there's not like there's gonna be any feelings lost over it and right here we see you send Max Steinberg to the rail, Ace Queen against Ace Jack. Once again, the theme continues. Things going your way um, with regards to these showdowns. Um, yeah, I, I don't lose them. I didn't lose any. I never had to face adversity. It's so crazy. Um, I mean, in the moment, were you aware of that, or was it just like, oh, this is this is my tournament, this is my jam? I'm just going. Oh, I was I was aware of oh, it. Yeah? <laughs> I was like, okay, cool. Like, I, hey, they gave me the best hand again. Like in a spot where all the money has to go in, and I'm the one with the best hand. That's awesome. Because if the cards are reversed, he's he's it, it, they say all the money's still going to go in if the cards are reversed, and I'm going to give him the double up. So, like it, it's just great. And again, now we can't finish worse than third. We made the final day since this is the November nine. They did nine to six, six to three, three to one. So we all got to go to sleep. I got to evaluate the situation again. You know, the blinds are. I have all these blinds. They have not as many blinds, and I'm going to try to small ball them down because they kind of. Again, the pay jump's going to be massive between third and second. If I can take advantage of that, I can really build my chip stack to get to heads up with a huge lead that's hopefully insurmountable. Right. And then this three-handed battle, you have a massive, massive lead, and we have you know a lot of hands to watch still from this battle. But as far as the bubble that you were in versus being aware of what's going on on social media and what your friends are saying and how your rail's interacting, what was it like to be the center of attention in that sort of way? Yeah, I mean, I tried to ignore it as much as I could. I, of course, you know that things are happening. Like, this is the biggest event, right? So pretty much most of the poker world, if not all of it, is probably tuning into this to figure it out. And I, I have my rail. I'm just trying to focus on the task at hand because I have my dudes behind me, the people I like, the people I'm living with, or, like, they're, they're watching the stream. They're recording the hands for me because since we are on this live broadcast, I get the opportunity to – to go back and see what people are doing in real time with cards up, which is something that you kind of have to do when you have this opportunity, when you, you're like on a final table with the stream, it really helps to have people telling you what people are doing. 
because if someone's getting way out of line, then like you can either take advantage of that, or if people are actually playing way too tight, again, you can take advantage of that. And that's something you can't really see because you don't know if the guy folding, you know, 20 hands in a row is just getting dealt seven, three off every hand, or if he's folding ace queen or something, you know? So having that information is something that you really need to master when they put this stuff on TV. That's just one more thing that you have that you can like, that you kind of have to learn and take advantage of, or at least that you can use to your advantage on a final table like this. And if you do it better than someone, then you're gaining a small edge on them again. Yeah, I'm seeing Calvin Anderson sitting in the background there. Uh, you mentioned him earlier as being your coach. Uh, were you fed a lot of information on the go? Did you guys have a system for it? How did you how do you approach this thing that you can you know use to your advantage in a way? Yeah, I have another guy next to Cal uh, writing down the hands, watching the stream. We're trying to write down all the important actions of the important hands, basically, because they didn't show your cards in this spot. I think unless you put chips in the middle which I actually complained pretty hard about beforehand. And then I know the very next year, you can see the laptop right behind, by the way, yeah. that's being watched on. Um, the very next year, they fixed that and shown everyone's hands, period. Because I thought that was kind of disadvantageous to me specifically as the biggest stack, because I knew I was going to be playing the most hands. And I knew that um, I, I was more interested in what people were folding than as more than like what they were playing, because I understand like, about stealing blinds and stuff people are folding their big blind a little too wide then i can attack that big blind specifically more and it, it was annoying beforehand and actually like i talked to i forget who ty or jack or someone about it uh there's nothing they could do of course at that point and that's fine because I, I i found that out like two days before the final table oh wow so yeah of course there's nothing they could do at that point but they fixed it in the future which i appreciate um yeah, but like I have the system, I have what's going on in front of me, I have what's being seen. This was a pretty big hand. This is one I, day three, I really ramped up to talking with these two dudes because of the people that would like probably react. I thought Neil was pretty heavy. Like I, I was being fed information that like Neil had some patterns with with specific tells about um, and if you talked, you could really loosen them up and maybe get get like the information you need from him to make your plays. Josh was um, Josh was a little similar. Josh was a lot more carefree than Neil. That's just who Josh is as a person. Like Josh is probably the other person that like the moment's not too big for him, even though he knows what's going on. Right. So the, these are the two people, especially I wanted to really talk, take my time with, uh, make decisions against. So let's listen then to see what's being said. Sure. Good call. Cool. And Blumenfield gets picked off by the. So we didn't get to hear what you said just before that, but you know it, it's it's <laughs> a lot of the talking was a one way street. Right. No right. one would talk back until after the hand. I mean, which was probably smart of them because again, if I think they talked more, I'd probably have more information to pick up from them. Right. At least that's the way I felt at the time. As far as far as your your. Um... Your that's a huge pot. That, that is that is a huge pot. You seventy five percent of all the chips three handed. You know, can't. Yeah, but it also puts both of them like close to each other now. So now they really got to worry about because Neil started with like twice as much as Josh, and now that I took like half of Neil's stack, they're close. Right. I mean, now I can on, really open up a hand like this, for instance. Good on Neil for for you know trying try, swinging for it and going for going for the bluff there. Can't... Yeah, that was that was the last time I think I got bluffed. <laughs> <on the> final <laughs> table. Um, then as far as like. The way you were being portrayed, as far as you know, Joe McKeon, he's he's the villain at the final table. He's going to run all over everyone. Um, when you watch the final table, you're actually jovial and talkative and, and smiling all around. Uh, but how do you look at you know how Joe McKeon, the person, is perceived? And I think that you know your Twitter persona, which comes across quite angry from time to time, uh, plays into that a little bit. However, you know, talking with you now face to face and you know reliving some of these moments, it seems to be uh, quite different. Yeah, well, every situation is different. Um, th this is one where it's like, I'm probably never going to do this again. I should enjoy it as much as I can. Um, and, and again, like all this talking was mainly for my own personal gain. But if it comes off well on TV, that's, you know, a, a great bonus for me. Um, on, on top of that, though, like Twitter's a little different. Um, life is a little different. You know, poker, like I, I've been involved in poker in a long time. And I have like this, I like the game. I love the game, all that stuff. But th there's other stuff that like, I've been around long enough to kind of know what's going on. And when I get in the spot like that, it's very easy for me to like, you know, chill. I kind of know what I want. At least I think I do. And I act towards it. So when I get in those spots, it's just, it's fine with me. I know who I am as a person and 
the people who I want to associate with, I do. So I, I think that's just kind of what I want. I, when you do something like win a tournament like this, you get all this newfound fame, all these people know you and you don't know them. And like for me specifically as kind of a more introverted person, that that's a little weird. Um, it, I definitely didn't adjust to it particularly well. Um, it, it took me a while to kind of figure out again what I wanted and how to adjust to it the way I would feel okay with it. And I think I did that as time went on. Maybe not in the best way, but I think like where I am at right now, I'm okay with. And and I mean, things go on as, as we're we're five years past this at this point, so it, it goes down a little bit. It'll still pop up like the notoriety. Like it, it's really weird when like I go food shopping and someone just walks up to me. It's like okay, if it's in a casino, you know, you can like understand it. But like when you're in a grocery store and it happens, it's like the hell's going on here. Like I'm, I'm scared. <laughs> breathe breathe please breathe <laughs> go get away from me but as yeah. is, is the is the fame the, the the one factor that you know you you don't like or you know as far as you know a little take it back to twitter you know you come out you come out pretty aggressive from time to time you come out swinging sometimes is, is that just you know you having fun because it's it's hard to gauge that sometimes when it's just written um you know it, it's, i'm just curious how you see that it's definitely both it's probably me being aggressive and it's also me having fun um it's just it's just what it is kind of as far as i'm concerned like i'm okay with it there there are times though where i feel like i i'm i could avoid a situation maybe so i do it or the situation arises where i need to say something it's it's really hard to explain it's more on like a situation by situation basis i think um I'm okay though. Like there's, there's nothing wrong with me. At least I don't think there is. I'm happier with where I was now after I won this thing the next year or two, it was a little difficult to like adjust. The fame is like just weird because it's not something you think is famous. And like, there's parts of it. I like there's parts of it. I don't like, but I have to deal with it anyway. You know, especially like whenever world series of poker time comes, I'm going to get recognized because you know, but like, like I said, like doing, getting it in a supermarket though, there's no reason for me to be recognized in a supermarket. So it's, it's weird. Right. I, I got to prepare myself. I got to adjust myself for it. I do. I, I, I've gotten better. I'm a lot more mature now than I was five years ago. And, you know, we're still going on with life. So how did this wasn't everything? No, but so how different is it's two things. How different is playing after becoming the world champ and how different is walking through the Rio hallways once you become the world champ playing is definitely different because now you have this stigma where like people in poker are probably more egotistical than a lot of other things so they want to they want to come at you and they want to try to mess with you they want to be like i'm coming at the best i want to beat the best i want to come at the best i want to do stuff against the best so it's like more of a challenge for me to figure out who's doing that and who's like trying to just play their cards because it, 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 I don't want to say it's an advantage for me, but it's definitely another piece of the puzzle that I have to figure out sometimes in hands. Right. And it, it's it's just kind of, it's there. It, it's different. I think if you ask any main event winner who's played a decent amount afterwards, they're going to say the same thing. People just kind of want to do stuff against you for the story. So, but, but as far as, you know, you're, you're a good player. So shouldn't it always play to your to your advantage in the sense that, players are going to make more mistakes because they want that sort of scalp. I think so. Yes. Um, but I still have to be the one to suss that out and, you know, punish them for it. <laughs> and I, I, I've definitely gotten bluffed more than I ever did before I won the main event. And, you know, that's cool. And I, you know, some bluffs are good bluffs and they work other times their bluffs get called and, you know, people give away, do something that they might not have done elsewise, which is, you know, adv advantageous for me, of course. Um, it, it, it's just another piece of the puzzle that we got to fix. Right. right? I got to figure out in games. Sometimes there's a lot of people who don't get care too. like professionals, especially they're not going to see me as like, Oh, this guy, I got to bluff him for a thing. They're going to see me as like, Oh, I'm a, he's a good player who kind of knows what's going on. So I need to play well against him. So I'm going to play well against them. Right. And you know, th th that's different. There's, there's a lot more of those players now than there were five, six years ago because everyone's getting better as time goes on. And it's just different. I and mean, that's something you see a lot more in a $3,500 tournament than in a $25,000 tournament. Yeah, for sure. But then as far as walking the real hallways, fandom in poker, 
You know, I feel I feel as though speaking from a bunch of main event champions recently, it fades a bit over time. But there's in that, yes. fir- that first year, you know, when you're the reigning champ, that's obviously the biggest one, and then it starts to fade. Um, but what's that like? What's it like when people come up to you with their stories and they want you, a, a minute of your time and sort of interact with you because of they've seen you on TV? Yeah, I kind of that that's the thing where I think I'm different than a lot of people. That's where I kind of I don't really like to give the minute of their time because generally when I'm in the Rio, I'm doing something important or I'm doing something that I think can help myself, you know, take care of my job. I'm I'm usually not just sitting in the Rio doing nothing for fun. So if if I'm there, I might be game planning for a spot I'm going to play or a tournament or whatever. Like maybe I'm on a break of a tournament. I need to use my break to recuperate mentally, chill. Um I, uh, like, I, I try to not spend time in the Rio if I can help it. So it, it's like, it's a weird thing. Cause I don't, I don't really give people the time of day that they might want from me, but I don't feel bad about it either because I'm, I'm kind of just looking out for myself more than I'm looking out for everyone else, which is generally what poker is and poker. It's a very selfish game. It's really all about you on the table. It's not about the other people it's it's not about your friends anymore you don't have friends at the poker table anymore you have all the friends outside of the poker table and that's awesome but you know like i said over said it a very good friend of mine and you know the biggest spot of both of our careers so and i don't feel bad about it obviously even though you know our life paths went two dramatically different ways because of it It, it's just kind of how it goes right and i'm happy with my social life outside of the final table i'm or outside the final table outside of poker i'm happy with it inside of poker and i'm I'm just kind of playing my own game in in there. And like when I get walked and recognized as time has gone on, I've definitely gotten a lot more, a lot less people coming up to me being like, yo, can, can we talk? Which is a good thing. Maybe my reputation is getting more known around everyone else. So they're kind of a little more scared to do it, which is like whatever to me. I'm I mean, not sad about it. That in- in- intimidation factor might also be helpful at, at the table. People, even even if they're perceiving you wrong versus what you're like, you know, just with friends, it's still, as far as your profession goes, might be a benefit. Yeah. Um, again, it's weird because some people might get very intimidated and there's definitely people who have been more scared to play with me because of that. And then there's other people that go the other way. They're like, right. screw it. I want to beat this boss up, you know, like... It, it, it's just a different type of thing. It's very weird. It, it's, and it, it's just another challenge for me when I'm at the tables that I have to deal with that a lot of other people don't have to deal with, but that's okay. That's great. You know, it, it's fun for me. As far, as far as becoming famous or, or, or at least spending, you know, 30 hours on ESPN uh, in prime time, what is that like for, you know, uh, friends and family outside of the game or former teachers or, or, or your neighbors or whatever it is? What has the response been like from those people that know you as j- just Joe from down the street? Oh, yeah, they love it. They're, you know, it, it, when you get to like friends, family, it's very foreign to them. So they don't understand poker as much. You know, they they might not even know the rules of the game. They don't understand what's going on, but they're just cheering for you because of support. And like, those are the people that like, that make you feel really good inside because they're not interested. They're doing it because of you. They're like paying attention because of you. And that's cool. And like, I know that a lot of people now like that, like to follow up on my progress just to see how I'm doing, even though they don't know what the hell's going on again. And that's great because that's like, that's good. You know, that, that just makes you feel good that people like care about you enough to want to do that. They're, they're basically, you, you created an interest for them in something they had no interest in. And the fact that you're the one that created it makes you feel a little good inside, I guess. Right. And it makes you feel good that they want to take that, that, uh, they want to like, they want to follow you because of you. So that makes you feel good as a person. Were there any moments that stood out from the aftermath of winning this tournament that, you know, you have, you know, special memories of like interactions with people or, or you know, just, I don't know, maybe just celebration in, in some kind of way. It's a good question. Um, I, so after you win this tournament, they give the winner a party in the Palazzo suites, which I'm sure you've probably been to a couple of times. Um, as have, you know, like a lot of the final tableists go and a lot of the rails, like there's hundreds of people in this suite the night of, and it's great. And there's all this alcohol and partying and it, it's, it's a very unique experience. Plus the plaza suites are probably the nicest thing I've ever been inside. Um, and that party, I remember pretty nicely. I, I was pretty exhausted, obviously, after winning the tournament, but, you know, I did what I could toward the middle, toward the end of it. I kind of bailed a little bit and 
it was great though because my parents got to you know my parents my grandparents they got to socialize with more people who like were involved in the industry more than they so they got to learn a little bit more about it what i did like how big a deal this was and i think it made them feel good all this stuff was really cool i think um afterwards too the days after you know i got to spend a lot of time with my parents and grandparents you know like over very expensive meals that they never had the opportunity to get before that I could treat them to stuff like that um, is what I kind of remember from it. That's really awesome, man. I mean, I I feel as though sharing an experience like this with family is one of the craziest things because clearly, and this is probably the same for everybody watching right now. If you tell them you're playing poker, they always say, Oh, I just, you know, get a job to finish school. Just do just (laughs) act normal. But then, you know, when you do something big, and, you know, in many people's cases, that might be just win something small or whatever. Have a, have a nice meal because of you, you using your profits in, in some kind of way to take someone out. Um, that, that puts the whole journey and, and the whole lifestyle choice uh, a bit more in perspective for those people as well. Um, and, and it's cool that you also had, had that moment because now, no matter what happens in the future, you can always look back on those moments and, and be like, yeah, at least I did that. Yeah, it's it's nice to take pe- uh, excuse me. It's nice to take care of the people who have taken care of you for your whole life. So when you get to give something back, it's a very good feeling. You know that happens a lot with professional athletes too. That's that's always a huge story, and and you know that's great. And like I, the fact that I had the opportunity to do it as well was just you know phenomenal. Yeah, that's that's really awesome. Um, we're still three handed here in the main event. Um, was it what you used to, you mentioned you were exhausted when it ended what was it exhausting because of how long it took was it the mental energy was it like an adrenaline dump after you know it's all over like how do you how do you look back on on that part of it yeah probably all the above and also just a lack of sleep for sure it's a little hard to sleep when it's just like oh by the way you're gonna play tomorrow for all this money and you you're the one that has all the chips and you're the one that's expected to win okay cool Good night. Like it, it doesn't work out that way, unfortunately, or it didn't for me. Even nowadays, like when I go deep in a poker tournament, and like I know I have day three tomorrow with with like twenty seven people left, I'll even struggle to sleep. Wow. Uh, yeah, I try to get some sleep. If I can get some sleep, I'm okay with it. Um, that's something that, like, I guess I just do okay at. Maybe I'm I'm a little better on lack of sleep than other people. That's like I don't know why I can't explain it, but it's just something in my life that. I guess maybe because I try so hard and I take this, I don't want to say personally, but you know, I take it very seriously that it maybe it messes with me mentally a little bit when it comes to something as simple as sleeping or eating. I know I'd struggled to eat a lot during the actual tournament too. Like I, I struggled to eat while the tournament was actually going on. Really? And then after like we bagged up for the day, I would eat all, all the food and then go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> That, that was pretty much it. Uh, yeah, I day one, day two, whatever. But like day four, day five, day six, I was struggling. I tried to have like a banana in the morning because it was probably all I could eat and then just chill for a while. Right. And are you like, you know, lots of caffeine? Are you, you know, smoking on the break? Like what, what's your routine? Or is it just, you know, trying to get through it in, in some kind of way? Yeah, I, I do none of that, actually. I don't drink caffeine and I don't smoke. At least I try not to. I do remember having like hot chocolates deep in the tournament because I need a little bit of sugar. Uh, outside of that, though, I'm, I'm just all natural. Wow. That, yeah, I, mean, I try to stay hydrated with water, and that's pretty much it. Right. Do you see it a lot? I mean, this is a question not about you, but do you see it a lot, people um, using performers in, performance enhancers in some kind of way? I mean, I've heard stories over over the years of people being on drugs in also all kinds of ways, which I cannot imagine being performance enhancing. But like, are there stories or people that are on certain routines to improve their play? I think a lot of people feel they play better on weed or Adderall or something. And if they want to do that, that's good for them. Um, that never interested me. I know a lot of people love to smoke and that's totally fine. As far as I'm concerned. Right. It, it mellows them out. Maybe like they're also the type of person that gets like really into the moment and something like that helps them stay level headed. Oh, here we got some talking going on. Let me, let yeah. me, let me go, go back and scroll back on this hand because I feel like it's a pretty interesting spot. Uh, talk us through yeah, what we're seeing. Just, I mean, he just raised pre-flop and bet three times. Um, this is a board that, like, I, I defended from the big line. I should have a good amount of this board. His flop bet is um, is very 2015. I don't think anyone would bet the flop with this type of hand anymore. Also, like, the race pre-flop is pretty 2015. He made it kind of small. So uh, it, it's a spot where, like, he shouldn't be bluffing, but I have a pretty good hand, and it's kind of dumb 
um because it's also hard for him to have like a really good hand he shouldn't have many sixes here for instance he, he could have like good tens he could have over pairs he could have some bluffs because clubs missed he could have maybe like ace eight or ace nine or something but I'm going to scroll back a tiny bit and then listen into sure. what you're saying because we haven't heard you talk much on the broadcast, but uh, I'm kind of curious what you were trying to get out of him. In the spot. Oh, wait, let's go back a little further. Yeah, I, I think I said something along the lines of like, uh, when you bet the flop, I thought you were going to bet three million. times, so I, I had to be prepared for it. So what you doing here, Josh? Turning trips. Plan for 7.7 .7 million. Yeah. I keep finding myself I, I, in the spot. I mean, if, if Josh said what uh, Norman said, I would have just folded really fast. <laughs> it would have been nicer to know. I couldn't shoot about $10 million. I don't know what I'd do by now. Probably give you your money. That, that was definitely a lie. Joe saying million, if Josh said more, he would have snap called. I had a feeling, too, when I saw the flop, you were going to bet three times. Just didn't know if you were or not. I mean, that came pretty clean for me. I, I always have a good hand. It was a bit better by now. This is another really Actually, good bet. Actually, he bet a good size here. Because I think if he bet more, I would have folded a little more comfortably. Right. I, I Spoiler, I call. Um, so. So how long? So obviously, we're watching a, a, a cut-down version of this broadcast. How, how long was this moment? Were you actually putting him to the test for like a couple minutes or? Yeah, maybe, maybe like two minutes. I don't know. Um, this final table, believe it or not, probably played a little more briskly than others, even though I know that's not what it's remembered for. But in spots like these... I feel like other people could be taking eight, nine, ten minutes, and all of us are taking two to three. So, what made you call? Was it was it just because him barreling three times and having a six in his range was just like seemingly impossible? He bet kind of small on the river. I thought I just had the better hand some of the time. I didn't feel good about it, but I was getting a good enough price, and I had a decent hand. There was a few hands that like I would definitely fold, and I think there were a few hands he would definitely bluff. Josh, Josh was not afraid to bluff. He was probably the one person on here that wasn't afraid to bluff. He actually bluffed me couple times i think uh, and again he shouldn't have too many sixes in the spot um i'm more worried about him having like ace 10 than i am ace six right so like yeah he had a good hand it's a good board for me it's blind on blind people are a little wider and blind on blind um in retrospect maybe i would fold but he bet he, he, he made a very good bet on the river because it was small if he bet bigger i think i would have um i would have folded pretty easily because again i don't think people are really bluffing in that spot against me in the spot like there's, there's all sorts of stuff to go over, and I could have probably answered that question a lot better five years ago. Hmm. But even looking at it now, it felt like I, I feel fine with it. Right. It Although I, if I folded, I'd totally be fine with it too. It, it, it's a whatever spot. Right. Um, when I was talking to Dan Coleman, and, and this is about heads up play, and we'll get to that as well, but um, Dan was explaining to me that back then he had a certain style and a certain approach for heads up sit and goes that basically – he was playing almost like a mechanical style where he would never deviate from what he, what he knew from all his experience that he would do. How much do you, in moments like these, deviate? And how much of it is assessing it in the moment? And how much is it, you know, like, okay, this type of sizing, this type of run out, I'm going to make this decision because that's just what I do. So in a heads-up sit-and-go, you're just playing to win. There's, there's nothing else. In a tournament like this, you get to play for ungodly amounts of money that every person busting you make more right so when when i get in a situation like this i'm i'm definitely it's different because i'm not playing normal poker at this point i'm playing final table poker i'm not trying to there's a big difference between playing on a final table and playing level three of the tournament if this is level three of the tournament a lot of these plays probably aren't similar and i also have a big stack and that that matters a lot more in a final table so when i have that opportunity i have to deviate by playing a little more aggressively and putting pressure on these guys to get them to maybe make some bad plays to win pots that i probably wouldn't win earlier in the tournament because they have to be very cognizant of the fact that if one of them busts the other one makes a million dollars that's kind of a big deal we can't forget that so i get to play really aggressive and pressure the crap out of people for it but then also, you mentioned earlier that you feel as though you are a good final table player. Is that just you recognizing and realizing equity and, 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 and spots and understanding that better? Or is there, is there, is there more sort of, I don't know, is there, is there more to it? Because it sounds so interesting when someone says, yeah, I'm a good final table player. 
I agree. It kind of, it sounds kind of silly when you say it and it sounds like very blow steam up your butt type deal because like, but, but it is really a thing that there's every, every pot kind of can change the actual complexion of how everything looks. So like when someone doubles up into the chip lead, now they're the chip lead. Now they're the ones that can't bust anymore. And that's kind of a big deal because now they have the opportunity to start playing really aggressively. And it, all this stuff kind of accumulates and being able to adjust on the fly while still understanding what people are doing is a real big deal. Because if I know someone doubles up into the chip lead, but they're going to be kind of snug and still fold a lot, then I could take advantage of that as like the not chip leader. Whereas like if I'm the chip leader, there's going to be a lot of chips going in the pot for my end i'm going to be trying to win a lot of small pots because i should be able to i might put pressure on you to the point where you might have to make a decision for your whole stack and potentially bust seventh instead of you know folding and easily busting higher something like that's a big deal right and it, it, it's a big difference having a chip lead to being like a medium stack and being a medium stack on a final table is pretty hard when you're a short stack on the final table you don't really have anything to lose it's whatever when you're a medium stack, though, it's different. You have um, you have to be aware of, of the people who can bust you and the fact that like you can make more money if you wait out other people. So it, it's very hard to do. Uh, in my in the recent bracelet event I was in, a lot of us were very close. So being able to navigate that situation was great. And in the bracelet, I ended up kind of folding to second to a degree. I folded to third to a degree. Then I like doubled up, and then someone busted. And like I started heads up. Uh, with uh, he probably had like two and a half to one lead or something. But that's like a great situation to be in because you get to the spot where money doesn't matter anymore. Your head's up. Like I did all I could to make as much money as I can. Now it's about winning. That That's a real big deal. There, there's no more folding up the money when you get to second place, when there's two people left. You're either getting second or you're first. So right. that, then at that point, all that stuff goes out the window and you just got to play the game. Up to that point, though, you know, there's these huge pay jumps up to the spot. And like if you have the opportunity to make people aware of that and kind of win a bunch of chips to get heads up to have a huge lead because of that, that's a real big deal. Whereas the other people kind of have to navigate and chill and like pick their battles, whether they really want to go to win all these chips to make, maybe put themselves in a big spot heads up or bust way before they get heads up. I mean, just because you have a lot of chips heads up too doesn't mean you win. It obviously just means you win more often. Right, for sure. All right, big moment here. Uh, Beckley makes it 2 million. You make it 5.4 with the Queens. Um, it seemed as though you, you were thinking about maybe flatting, but maybe that did not fit into how you had been playing before. So that might have been, you know, a bit more of a giveaway than just putting in the three bet there with all your aggression. And then Neil just like very, very casually goes all in almost immediately with the deuces, um, you know, a bit a bit too yeah. too much from Neil there, aggressive wise. Yeah, he should he should fold because he doesn't have any fold equity as two. So even if I'm bluffing, we're gonna be flipping. Um but again, this is a spot where like Neil's really short and Josh has a good amount of chips, so I could be picking on Josh a lot here. Right. Because Josh Josh should be folding a lot to me because he knows Neil doesn't have many chips, and if Neil goes, he makes a million dollars. Uh that that might be the only consideration for flatting because like if he's getting it in really tight, and I know I'm not gonna fold this hand pre flop that I should chill, but he could call with like some medium strength hands and we could see the flop. And like, if, if I'm going to raise him with a bunch of crap, I have to raise him with good hands too. Uh, Neil, Neil should probably just fold because he has no fold equity. It's a dumb spot. Um, he was probably a little frustrated that he got to this point where he came in second place. Now he's pretty clearly in third place. Um, you know, he wants to get heads up, of course, who doesn't? But this was just a good spot for me because I had it this time. I was re-raising Josh a good amount. It doesn't show in the broadcast, but I was doing a good amount of re-raising him before we got to the, uh, before we got to this point. Before he got all these chips, he got a lot. Of, he, he won that big pot against me, but he also won a couple pots against Neil to like take away Neil's chips, and that was that was kind of a big deal. All right, so listen to this uh, final moment here of Neil. Blumenfield's got to have a deuce, or it's McCann and Beckley for the title. Marchese didn't like the shelf. <laughs> the river card is a king. McCann takes the pot. Neil Blumenfield takes third place. Excellent. You played, you played better than every single person expected. Yeah, that was a generic. He's 65 years old. 65-year-olds generally aren't very good at poker statement. Like, I mean, getting third place is like probably bittersweet, but like, you're going to look back at this and be like, holy shit, I got third place in this tournament. Right. Especially for someone like him because he's not like – this is like his – first and maybe only like deep run up to this point so but is, is it a genuine compliment 
Of course. Oh, yeah, of course it is. All right. So it, 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 when I hear it now, it probably comes out as douchey. It's like, yeah, like, yeah, I, I like no one. I, I didn't expect anything of you, but it was, of course, it was a genuine compliment. Right. I didn't say anything mean to anybody this final table. At least I tried not to. Right, right. If it came off that way, that's my bad. No, no, it didn't. I was just curious, like, if if that was you just joking around or if you actually, oh, you know. Oh, no, of course I was serious. I mean, I didn't know the dude at all. We didn't play at all until this final table. So, like, our whole main event experience was in November. It wasn't at all in June. Right. So, or July, whenever it was. So that's a real big deal. All right. You here. know, it's like, there's a little bit I get to know about you. You know, we're just going to try to beat each other's heads off for millions of dollars. But, you know, I, I got respect for you. Yeah, and then all of a sudden... You know, as, as it goes in a tournament, you're down to two players. But in this case, they put a ton of cash. It's guys, if you're watching, it's fake. It's like two. two <laughs> I know. I wish I looked at it more. It's two hundred. People ask me the question if it's real or fake, and I'm like, I don't, I don't know. So what they do is they put a um, hundred dollar bill on each side and all singles in the middle. I, I now know that. Yeah, I heard that in the past. Um, I heard that after the fact. That's what happens. Which is just, funny because like I could have like looked at a brick and been like, yeah, what the hell. <laughs> And it's 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 purely for security reasons, obviously. Of course, uh, <laughs> I would sure hope that's not seven million dollars sitting there in case someone wants to shoot up the place and rob it. This would be a uh, yeah. So it gave it gave not, yeah. It th th that would be a target that's like not very well hidden. I right. Know there's you right. know millions of security guards and with guns and all sorts of stuff. I felt very safe in the moment. Right. But you know, in retrospect, it's like whatever. But then also the bracelet. Like I mean, there's there's cash on the table and also that giant bracelet, which yeah, that's real. <laughs> I, be, I believe I believe that's real, and I also believe that has that a qu real. quite a bit of monetary value. Um, that's what I'm sold. That's so, what I'm sold. So the, so the bracelet. What's your what's your relationship with the bracelet? Is it safety deposit the box? Is it like in in a, in a nice case? Is it like I don't know? Did you sell it on eBay? Like what what happened to the bracelet? I I have possession of it, but I'm not going to tell you where or how. Okay, but so, it's still mine. I didn't sell it. Good. Well, it, but I ain't gonna tell nobody where that thing is. As, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> as as far as far as it as a trophy, do you think it's like a really cool trophy, or do you think why not give me something I can actually, you know, like a cup or something you can you can display in in a better way? Like, how do you feel about the bracelet as a trophy? Well, it, it's customized, which is pretty cool. Inside of the bracelet, they put the two cards you win the tournament with. Oh wow. Yeah, so that that's actually really cool. Um, it, it, it's slightly more personalized. Your name's not on it, but you know it says like 2015 main event champion, whatever. Um, and, and that's really great. I, I don't think anything like it, it, it's definitely one of the cooler trophies I have that I'll ever win, if not the coolest. I don't think anyone will ever dispute that. that that's not arguable. I mean, the, the thing itself is always going to be there. It's just never going to get taken away. Right. Like it, it's a sign of this. What winning the tournament will never be taken away, no matter what I do in my life. No one can ever deny that or whatever. They can shortcome it all they want, which is you know their prerogative. But it it's mine. It's something I did. I got cards in there to prove it. Right. And those are the actual <laughs> and, and it's cards. Great. Yeah, I think they're the actual RFID cards. That's really cool. They're the huge. They're the uh, the font on an RFID card, as you can see, kind of in the camera is huge compared to the other to like a regular playing card we didn't play with these until we got on these tv tables and then you're playing heads up um as you as you alluded to earlier you know there's there's no other option but to win because you already got second place locked up um was it pedal to the yeah. metal for you uh, at this point i watched this hand and little answer your question <laughs> all right look at how awkwardly he puts these chips in i thought i picked something up all right so tell me talk talk he, me through it he just seemed very unconfident with his re-raise in this spot the way he did it just was not the, it wasn't consistent with the way he was doing it beforehand right and and I, I in game i picked this up and i did something about it going to the raising deck i also have a really bad hand so like I, I can't really call on this spot i should be folding or raising if i'm going to play the hand but you know i i this is not a good hand to raise with obviously i got garbage but just very confident in my live read in that spot that he was kind of weak it just it looked very unnatural and I, I decided to test it which is something that like your heads up on the main, in the main event final table a lot of people might not do that they might not go with their reach because they don't want to look wrong they don't want to look stupid but i was not in that situation i i didn't feel that which is like just i, I don't know maybe just the way like my genetics are or build or whatever you can tell how excited i look to win that i'm like yeah i'm i'm, I'm on fire right now i know what's going on 
I mean, Some, something like that is a huge confidence builder. Because if I lose that, it's like ah, right, I was wrong. But like winning that, it's like all right, I got this. We're we're gonna we're gonna get this kid. I was gonna say, is that the is was that the moment where you're like, okay, this is over. I got him. I mean, I felt that way the whole time. But that one, you can tell, I looked like I'm beaming after. Oh, they're gonna show the, oh, the router I, or the river I hit to survive. Pretty pretty big hand to to win. You know, not busting on day six. I mean, for the people unaware, that was day six, same same opponent. Uh, however, you were in trouble, and you spiked the river there to stay alive. And he just kept surviving in the tournament with his 10 bigs against me. And I hit this obnoxious river with the final two tables where I'm just running everybody over, and I'm just like, it looks like I'm bluffing every hand, but I'm not. He's, he's trying to, and he makes this absurd fold in a hand where, like, he has a really strong hand, and he sussed out the fact that I really had a straight, I guess, or something. He said something I remember in the hand, like, "You must have two pair of straight," and made made this incredible fold with not many chips behind in a spot where it's it's like absurd. I mean, good on him. Like, do do you still? Like, yeah, he was a cockroach, dude. He didn't go away. <laughs> Does he <laughs> still play? Time. Like, I haven't heard the name Josh Beckley in a very long time. Yeah, I haven't either. I know he moved to Florida and did stuff. Um, Look, I smile when I hit three of a kind. That's funny. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't really keep in touch with him anymore. I know he had some issues that aren't really uh, – I'm not really – I shouldn't be talking about. But I'm, as far as I know, he's he's fine. Okay. Um. Yeah, he, he moved to Florida. I think he plays a lot more recreationally now. Like, he took his money and was like, I'm going to make a life for myself with it. And, you know, right. poker may or may not be the life. But he didn't go many places afterwards. I don't know – his mindset as far as what he wanted to do with his money. I think he did what he wanted to do with his money and, you know, respect to him for doing that. Um, you know, we all did what we should have done with our money, or at least what we think we should have done with our money. So, you know, he's, he's living in Florida. He got a lot healthier after this. So good for him. Yeah. He, he maybe felt like he made enough money where he didn't really need to make money anymore in that regard. So that's his decision. Right. I mean, m m like, like I said earlier, you know, some, some people get motivated by getting money. Some people get, you know, I mean, lazy is not, a, I'm very lazy. Lazy is not a bad term. Lazy means that you're just chilling. You're just having a good time hanging out, doing your well, thing. He, he put in the work to get all this money. So right. it's up to him what he wants to do afterwards with it. If he wants to get lazy with it, that's his decision. Whereas like me, I don't want to get lazy with it. I want to keep going. I want to go higher because I didn't really know anything better, but I wasn't just going to be like, oh, I want a bunch of money. I'm going to sit and right. never do anything again and just live on it. That, that's too boring for me. So how do you look at your future then? Like, how do you look at, you know, of course, you know, we're COVID like a big crisis going on, but like, let's say things get back to normal next year. Um, are you in, 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 I don't know, in a way people say like, are you a lifer? Is, is poker, you know, your, your life and your, your passion in that sort of way? Or are you also venturing out into different things now that you have a bit more, you know, room to play with? Think things can change. I mean, I, I, for the most part though, I'm probably, I'm still in poker for the foreseeable future. Absolutely. And who knows in a couple of years if that changes, but there's there's almost no reason for me to do anything else. I don't have the passion to do anything else. I haven't found anything I've really wanted to like um, dedicate my life to or put a lot of resources in that hasn't been more than like a generic whatever to me. Right. Um, yeah, I'm going to still be and I'm going to when live poker is back and it's, you know, safe and whatever or like the world is just comes back to a spot where I feel a lot more comfortable playing. I'm going to go back. I'm going to play live poker. I'm going to do what I can, you know, this year's, I, I can't say the year's lost anymore because I was actually in the three months we were allowed to play. I had a couple of scores and then I just won this bracelet for a lot of money. So the year's definitely not lost. I'm going to make a good amount of money this year off poker, which is like incredible since it feels like a lost year, but like I might not be playing a lot of poker out. So after this month is up and this world series ends here in America, I'm, th there isn't much for me to do right up to that point. But I'm I'm just chilling, kind of waiting for this thing to go through, doing what I can with it, you know, doing the little bits of things I can do to maintain the social life or whatever. And here we got pocket tens. Yeah, this hand back in 2015, wow. this should have probably been the end of it. Right, I was gonna say. If he just limp folded off like 20 bigs, heads up, that's a little tight. I mean, you 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 described his style earlier. He was still sticking to it. That might be a spot where uh, maybe he read something into me. Maybe hmm. he, I looked really comfortable. Because, like, as soon as it happened, he's like, oh, I knew you were going to raise here, and he still folded, which, like, with, with a hand like that, 
saying something like that and doesn't make sense unless like he, he has a reason for it. Right. Cool comparison yeah. there with, with uh, the Megatron jersey from Reese and you wearing Iverson and uh, Merson, yeah. Merson having the Orioles one back in 2012. Um, it, Can't it, go wrong with the jersey. I mean, did you did you get a lot of comments on that um, if, from the NBA community or from just from players and stuff like that? Well, after, after the thing ended, uh, 888, who I'm also wearing a patch for at the time, hooked me up with the Sixers thing. Um, we got to go to a game and like I got recognized and stuff. And like I got to shoot T-shirts out of the cannon. That was cool. Oh, that's awesome. But my brother got to do it, too. And he was, let's see, five years ago, I was 24. He was 11 or 12 at the time. So like that's a huge deal for him. That's really awesome. Yeah, he 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 enjoyed that uh, since that that was pretty absurd. Yeah, it's really cool how that how that yeah. how it, it's cool when you know our poker bubble turns into this na- na- national phenomenon once a year for the main event final table, and all of a sudden you know people are exposed to poker, which you know doesn't happen all the time. Nope, it doesn't have to. But if you like sports, it pops up on ESPN too, so you're gonna probably watch it. As time is going on, I think it is getting bigger. We might never have a boom, but it is still gradually growing. Right. Look at the numbers of these fields. You have all these people finding money and making time to go to these tournaments, you know, and it's like incredible. That's something you didn't have back in the day. And and you you won a relatively small main event, which is kind of crazy. Yeah. <laughs> All the main events around me were paying off a few more million, but you know, you can't be picky when you're winning a main event. <laughs> you're going to be happy with that. With, with, uh, you're going to be happy with whichever one you get. Yeah, you didn't. You didn't call Jacobson and say, "Hey, where's my? Where's the? Where's the other three million? No, nah, I do that to Blumstein because I'm friends with him. I was friends with him way before the tournament started. I was friends with him before either of us won the main event. So that's funny. Like, yo, you you got an extra million. <laughs> it's it, you're picking up the tab today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, here we go. Let's listen in on this hand. We're flipping. Ace 10 fours. Yeah. Nobody flips with McKeon. Standard hand. Crack. He's got 19 bigs or something and a small pair. Usually the best exactly. way to play it is to just shove him in. Right. I got Ace 10. I know he's not shoving in like hands that dominate me with. So he's got a lot of small pairs. He's got like weaker aces or like two broadways or something. Or at least that's what he should have. So this is like actually worst case scenario for me that I'm flipping. When I see my hand, I'm like so excited to play it. How long was this ahead? hand though? It gets overplayed a lot. Ace 10 offsuit, man. Like this isn't like people are known for like their winning hands. Like you got Doyle with 10 deuce. And I know you got Martin for the 10 for 10. Cause it worked out. Cause you had pocket tens. I got ace 10 off. That's not a hand that like means anything to a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's not like every time you look down on ace 10 off, you think of this moment. No, man. I don't even think about it at all. Ace 10 off is such a weird hand to play too. Um, it's like a good but not great hand. It, it, like you can overplay or you can underplay it. There's ways. So it, it's a tougher hand to play. Heads up, it's a very good hand, of course. Um, but in general, this hand doesn't doesn't mean much. I I, I forget the suits that I win with <laughs> most of the time when they ask. I'm like, ace hearts, ten of diamonds. Ace, I know they were both red. That's all I remember. Now the river card. Beckley's got to have yeah. a four. No, no adversity the entire time. Literally none. The your, most adverse hand I had was calling off with that 10-8 and losing to that ace-6 on the river. I was going to say that was your biggest. That, like, that, that was the biggest hand I lost probably the entire time. So they they didn't like show a hand that I lost a lot of chips in because there weren't any. I mean, that's, that's, yeah. that's, that's, that's the way every player wants it to be. You know, you just start with the final table chip yeah. lead and you just <laughs> run, it, run it down. That's the absurd part. I didn't have to fight. Whereas like all these other dudes, they have to fight. Scott had to fight hard. Jacobson obviously had to fight hard. Right. Um, we had to fight hard. Um, I don't think like I'm trying to think of someone who didn't really have to fight hard. Like Jonathan had to fight hard back then. And he had all the chips too. I'm, I'm that's Raymer like, probably didn't have to fight very hard. I was going to say so long ago though. Raymer. Oh, Jamie gold is probably the only one. Jamie gold didn't have to fight hard. Yeah, that's true. Jamie Gold and Raymer, like way back in the day, but once you got to the November 9th part of it, like, yeah, I definitely had to fight the least out of anybody that's won the tournament, and that's just like pure luck and like absurdity because there there have been bad beats on the final table, and somehow none of them went against me. It's 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 nuts, man. Like so much has to go go right to make the final table, and then yeah. and then once again, the final table is almost like a new event, like. It all has to go exactly. right once once more, which is just insane. Yeah, the first time I was all in in the tournament, I hit a 10 on the river, so. 
Yeah, that's that's you know, just that might have been the only time I was all in in the tournament, which is absurd. Wow. All right, we've reached the end of this final table. Uh, as everybody can Hi, see, mom. then there's 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 mom mom McKeon, uh in the yeah. shot as well. I figured that's a, a great way to to pause the yeah. final frame here. Uh, for everybody watching, please like this video, subscribe to the channel. Turn on the notification bell so you get to know whenever a new video comes out. We do top five WSOP videos every Wednesday. We do day one WSOP coverage every Monday. And we do run it back twice a week, every Thursday and Tuesday. So, Joe, thanks once again for reliving this with me. I'm curious, though, how many times have you rewatched this, the final table? <laughs> a lot. Quite a few. That's awesome. I definitely watched the long version, too, with every hand a few times. Um, I haven't watched it in a long time, but back in like 2015 2016 especially i'm like all right i'm still living in the glow of this let's you know let's do it again and again and again i love it that's awesome all right for the people watching back home thank you so much for joining us joe thanks for joining me for this uh epic final table where everything went right which is obviously a good thing and yeah th <laughs> thank you for uh for letting me relive it again yeah no with worries you so being able to discuss it that was, this was a uh, this was definitely unique i haven't gotten to discuss it with people so this was this was fun that's awesome, man. Great to hear. Um, thanks so much once again, and uh, we'll catch you guys on the next one.